Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Uh, welcome to Penn Law School and the University of Pennsylvania. I'm Ted Ruger, the Dean of the Law School. Um, it is my great uh, pleasure to welcome this incredibly distinguished group, um, including uh, President Gutman and Justice Kennedy, who are walking in. Um, we are uh, a bit behind schedule, so my introduction will be uh, um, outrageously brief for such a distinguished conference and distinguished uh, speakers that follow me, but it is such a pleasure to host uh, so many uh, scholars, judges, um, uh, officials, um, and others, lawyers, uh, uh, alumni from uh, so many uh, from far and wide. Uh, we're thrilled with the topic of the conference. Uh, the, the, the issues of fairness and impartiality are as pressing and as under threat now as they ever have been, both here in this country and around the world, so could not be a better topic. And there could not be a better uh, leader of this university who, who kind of brings events like this together. This is a quintessentially University of Pennsylvania event in that it's uh, cross-disciplinary with the Annenberg School of Communications and the Law School. Um, and uh, Amy Gutman, as president of this university, has uh, fostered, um, certainly from the law school perspective, the most cross-disciplinary engaged uh, law school in the country. 75% of our JD graduates graduate with a degree or certificate from somewhere else at this uh, great university. And that is uh, both because of the philosophy we have, but through the leadership and the structures and the finances in place to allow that to happen. And that is all due to uh, uh, somebody I'm tremendously privileged to work with. And I will hand the podium over to the president of the University of Pennsylvania, Amy Gutman. Thank you. Ted, and I really um, want to uh, express just quickly my appreciation to Ted Ruger for leading this phenomenal law school and his terrific leadership. So let's give it up for Ted Ruger. <laughs> so it's great to see so many of you here today for what I take to be a very, very important topic and an important gathering. And it's wonderful to see so many current colleagues and friends that I've known for a long time. Welcome, Kathleen. It's wonderful to see you and so many other people here today. I want to begin by um, thanking Judge Rendell. Um, it's so great to have Midge Rendell back here um, to her alma mater and also um, to recognize what she's been doing. Um, I have to say few rival, none exceed uh, Governor Rendell and Judge Rendell's commitment to civics education and engagement. And the theme of my very brief welcoming remarks is going to be how important the marriage of civics education and understanding the rule of law and supporting a fair and impartial judiciary are. And Midge, you have devoted your, your life um, to not only talking the talk, but walking the walk of bringing these two together. As a university, Penn's bedrock commitment, our distinctive niche, if you will, in the higher uni education universe is to demonstrate the power of knowledge put into practice. And Judge Rendell has done that. Um, if anybody would like a master class in what this ideally looks like, look no further than Judge Midge Rendell's, her career. And so, Midge, Judge Rendell, thank you. Let's give it up for Judge Rendell. I welcome all of you to the Fair and Impartial Judiciary Symposium. A very, very special welcome to U.S. Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy. Thank you for being here. And all of our honored guests, panelists, moderators, I will stop calling out names because you all deserve to be called out. But more importantly, you deserve to hear from the speakers and the panels. I do want to say we're very grateful to the organizing partners of the symposium, the Rendell Center for Civics and Civic Engagement at the Annenberg Public Policy Center, 
Penn Law and the Pennsylvania Commission on Judicial Independence. So um, let me just say a few words um, that are personal as well as from my position as president, but really are um, from uh, the top of my mind and the bottom of my heart about why the topic and this gathering is so important. So um, one of my favorite cartoons from decades ago shows a child looking up at one of our founders, Thomas Jefferson, tugging on his coattails and saying, if you take these truths to be self-evident, then why do you keep harping on them so much, right? <laughs> and the truth is that these truths are not self-evident in some ways. I mean, you have to have a very specific understanding of what self-evident means, that they're rooted in the best of human nature, but they're not, they do not go without teaching. They do not go without understanding. And that, to me, really underscores the importance of what you are all doing, we are all doing today, but not just today, the take how important the takeaways are from this conference. Um, nothing in my mind, and my mind may be wrong, but I'm deeply committed to this, nothing in my mind is more fundamental to the future of American democracy than civics education and the rule of law, the independence of the courts in a free and impartial judiciary. I thought about that long and hard before saying that this morning, and I deeply believe that, and you don't want to hear from me about all the evidence because you're going to get a lot more of it in today from the people who are experts in particular fields. But let me just say that it's not only, it is importantly about, when we talk about a fair and impartial judiciary, about the federal courts, but it's also essential that we understand the critical role of state and local courts. More than 90% of the millions of cases that judges hear annually occur in such courts. By contrast, only a few hundred thousand make it to the appellate courts and only a relative handful of highly publicized, highly consequential cases reach the Supreme Court. Do state court and federal court judges approach their roles in cases differently? An all-star lineup of judges, reformers, and litigators will cover this today. And on matters pertaining, pertaining to the Supreme Court, Ted and Linda Greenhouse will offer a master class, and I thank Linda Greenhouse for all she has done in her career and continues to do and highlight the importance of the Supreme Court. So thank you, Linda, for being with us today. So from the US Supreme Court to the Philadelphia Court of Common Pleas, another unifying element stands out to me as equally critical, and that is all the people on the other side of the bench. Courts, of course, are not ends in themselves. They're the means to the ends of legal fairness and impartiality, what one might call legal justice, which is not all of justice, but it's a very important part of what makes us uh, a good democracy. And my field has been for decades democratic theory and education. We need to keep this notion fundamental in our minds. How do we better educate and engage people in the work of ensuring a fair and impartial judiciary. Because no matter how strong and wise and well-educated judges are, if there aren't citizens in our society, enough citizens who believe in the role of the rule of law and the role of a fair and impartial judiciary, it will be almost impossible um, to actually maintain it. As our founder, Benjamin Franklin, once wisely said when asked, what do we have, Mr. Franklin, a republic or a monarchy, famously said, a republic if you can keep it. So more important still, I believe, is the question, how can people believe the judiciary is fair and impartial? 
if access to courts um, has been and still is inequitable. So there are real <coughs> issues there as well. Consider the state civil courts that handle the vast majority of the country's caseload each year. Roughly 75% of those cases involve at least one party without a lawyer because legal counsel in civil cases is not a guaranteed right. Um, in order for a democratic nation of laws to move forward, the judiciary needs to be fair, but people also need to believe it to be fair and to understand how important it is, to know and see its fairness at all levels. This is very much at the heart of today's Civics 101 discussion. So there's a reason this topic comes late in the day. I think it's the natural culmination of all the other discussions. The future stakes could not be higher as Justice Kennedy, Justice Bebas, and Justice Levy will explore. So battles over voting rights, health care, abortion, regulation, and campaign finance, all of these battles are things that when I was in the classroom every day, I taught in a um, ethics, a democratic ethics and public policy course. These are now less likely to be decided in Congress because of political gridlock, which is not a new phenomenon. It was actually built in to the Constitution, through constitutional design to make it harder to legislate in this country um, for reasons uh, that you won't go into, but it just means that the nation's courthouses are extremely important for all of these issues. Fairness and impartiality in the judiciary are quite literally a matter of life and death. So my fervent hope, having told you how high the stakes are, my fervent hope and expectation is that with the leadership in this room and with the resources and efforts of the Rendell Center, the Annenberg Public Policy Center, Penn Law, which is our consummately multidisciplinary law school in the nation. I don't mean to cast aspersions on the law schools that so many of you went to, but I do believe that Penn Law is the best in this way, if not the best. Um, we're not litigating that today, but I am thanking Penn Law for being the site of this and the Commission on Judicial Independence. I know that the stakes of judicial independence are always high, but they've never been higher than in our time. And so many others, are bringing civics education and legal education together, I know that we will help ensure that our judiciary stands tall as a pillar of fairness and justice. If we don't do this in the United States, nobody else will, I believe, we can do this, we must do it, and we're at a point, as we always are, periodically, of a real threat in our culture of the belief and the support of a fair and impartial judiciary. So with that, I will just say, your stakes are high. I believe you will come through. My expectations are high. I'm sure you will exceed them. Thank you and welcome. Good morning. I'm Midge Rendell, a senior judge on the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit and chairman of the board of the Rendell Center for Civics and Civic Engagement. On behalf of the Rendell Center and the Annenberg Public Policy Center, I would like to welcome you to the Symposium on the Fair and Impartial Judiciary. The Symposium is the brainchild of Kathleen Hall Jamison, the director of the Annenberg Public Policy Center who, when the Rendell Center was incorporated and became housed at the Policy Center five years ago, told me that she wanted us to do something on judicial independence. Well, this is that something. We started working on the symposium over a year ago, and I'm gratified that so many of the most brilliant thought leaders on this topic have come together to educate and inspire us today. The lineup is truly amazing, and I'm so very grateful that for their participation especially Justice Kennedy, who, although retired, seems to be busier than ever. So his being with us today is special indeed, and we are most grateful to him. 
I bring regards from Kathleen, who unfortunately could not be with us, as she's hosting a conference at Sunnylands, the Annenberg Retreat in the Palm Desert. I also bring regards from former Governor Ed Rendell, who is under the weather and very disappointed that he couldn't be with us today, but he's definitely going to watch the video. <laughs> and I'm really sorry he can't be here because he shares my vision and speaks passionately about what we do at the Rendell Center. He loves to talk about how enthused the students are about our programs. I want to publicly thank Kathleen and the Public Policy Center for their leadership and especially for the financial support of this symposium. We're also grateful to three foundations, Thomas Skelton Harrison, Horace W. Goldsmith, and the Katz Foundation. And of course, to Penn Law for its participation and Dean Ruger for his hospitality. The staff has been wonderful and really have, are the ones who have made this possible. And we should also mention the Pennsylvania Commission on Judicial Independence with whom we have collaborated greatly in the past. I want to introduce to you my three partners in the planning of this endeavor. First, Beth Specker is the Executive Director of the Rendell Center. She's in the back. She's in the back because this is a work day. Uh, and Eleanor Barrett, who is the Associate Dean for Curricular Affairs here at Penn Law. And also happened to serve as my law clerk for three years. And also uh, Kathy Smith, who I think is outside, who worked with our logistics and speakers. If you have questions or needs during the program, this is the team. The Rendell Center for Civics and Civic Edu Engagement is a nonprofit corporation that we founded, Ed Rendell and I, five years ago with the vision of educating the next generation of citizens. We do that through programs aimed at elementary students, primarily fourth and fifth graders. We provide curriculum on civics, targeted activities that help them not only learn the basics of civics, but also help them acquire the skills necessary for citizenship. Our hallmark activities are the literature-based mock trial, an essay contest called the Citizenship Challenge, and candidate debates at election times when the students ask the questions, and I would say the tough questions. We also conduct a summer teacher institute each year for 35 teachers who come from across the country. This year, the topic of the, of the institute was the First Amendment, and it was funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. We believe that if we teach our children the importance of our democracy when they're young, will not have to convince them later on of the importance of participating in their government, voting, and jury service. The Annenberg Public Policy Center recently conducted a survey to coincide with this very program in order to gauge the understanding about our government and the courts. 22% of those surveyed could not name a single branch of government, and only 39% could name all three. Civics education is being pushed aside in favor of subjects that are on standardized tests. Increasingly, our citizenry doesn't know how our government works, let alone the responsibilities they have to keep our rep representative democracy vital. <clears throat> At the Rendell Center, <clears throat> we're trying to reverse this trend. We're gratified that our programs are being well received in schools in the Delaware Valley and in Pittsburgh as well. And I invite you to visit our website to learn more about what we're doing. Today we come together to consider an important topic, the fair and impartial judiciary. 87% of those surveyed in the recent Annenberg Public Policy Center survey believed that these qualities were very important. Yet 57% were of the view that the Supreme Court, quote, gets too mixed up in politics, end quote. Although two thirds believe that the Supreme Court operates in the best interest of the American people, nearly half believe that it should be less independent and should, quote, listen a lot more to what the people want, end quote. Regrettably, that is the job of the legislature, to do the will of the people, not the role of the courts. Our founding fathers believed it was essential that the judiciary be independent. The Constitution provides that federal judges shall have life tenure and their compensation shall not be reduced. The alternative to this system as the framers understood all too well, is one in which a ruler can and does dock the judge's pay if they don't do his bidding, as King George III did regularly. Yet the concept of judicial independence enshrined in our Constitution is not well understood, let alone appreciated. This became apparent to retired Supreme Court Justice David Souter, 
when he volunteered to show a Russian lawyer around the Supreme Court several years ago. The Russian lawyer seemed to know a lot about the Supreme Court opinions, and David asked him, well, how is this? And the Russian lawyer said, well, during the Cold War, when one of his lawyer friends would get a copy of an opinion, they would gather together clandestinely and, and discuss it. Uh, as, as they were going around, the Russian lawyer asked Justice Souter what he thought was the most important opinion of the modern Supreme Court. And Justice Souter replied, as many of us might, Brown versus Board of Education. Well, he could see that the Russian lawyer was not pleased with this, so Justice Souter asked him, well, what do you think is the most important ruling? And the Russian lawyer said, the Nixon tapes decision. Because in my country, the thought that the head of state could be told what to do by the court is unheard of. And Justice Souter said at that moment, he had an epiphany. We don't teach our children civics. We don't teach them how unique our system of government is. How sad, but true. Today, I hope we will each experience an epiphany regarding the independence of the judiciary and the importance of keeping it fair and impartial so that judges can rule as the court did in the Nixon tapes decision, being faithful to the rule of law rather than the whim of kings and the populace. So now I'd like to give you just a few housekeeping items. In your folders, you'll see there are cards. Please use these to write questions you may have during the sessions and hold them up. We have volunteers in Rendell Setter t-shirts that will come and collect them for you. Uh, and unless specific panels decide otherwise, we won't be taking live questions from the audience, but some panels may choose to do it differently. You also have Wi-Fi information in your folder and biographies, extensive biographies of all the speakers. Uh, our lunch session is two floors up in the Levy Conference Center. We will be asking that you move quickly after the morning wrap-up uh, because the program will start promptly at noon. Uh, last but not least, silence your cell phones. All right, we're going to begin with our first session. What does fair and impartial judiciary mean and why is it important? And we have a wonderful speaker, David Levy. My first thought as to how to introduce David Levy is that he is a Renaissance man. If you Google him, you'll find he is a poker player from Israel and a chef from Maine. But those are not our David Levy. <laughs> our David Levy is president of the American Law Institute, the leading independent organization in the United States that produces scholarly work to clarify, modernize, and otherwise improve the law. He also serves as the director of the Balsh Judicial Institute at Duke University. His bio lists his other accomplishments, including his stint as a federal judge and dean of Duke Law School. But it fails to mention that, that he, while he may not be a poker player or a chef, he is a fly fisherman, an expert in English history, and last but not least, has been seen rounding up cattle on horseback, no less, on his wife's ranch. I give you David Levy. Thank you. All true. Uh, it is a great honor to be with you today to speak about the importance of fair and impartial courts and the role of judicial independence in achieving that goal. Thank you, Judge Rendell, for convening this important discussion. Thank you for Justice Kennedy for being here today. and Thank you, all of you. I begin with two brief stories. Uh, consistent perhaps with the introduction. Some years ago, my wife Nancy and I took a river kayaking course on the American River in Sacramento. The course turned out to be nothing short of terrifying, and I've tried to forget most of that experience, especially the part where the, no the novice kayaker hangs upside down, about to drown or sustain a serious concussion. I did learn one thing that I have carried to this day. If there is a large boulder that you must avoid, never look at it. If you do, your body will turn and you will collide with the very thing you wish to avoid. In this conversation, uh, there is one boulder I particularly wish to avoid, at least as we begin our trip down river. And that boulder, if you will, and with apologies, Mr. Justice, is the United States Supreme Court. If we even start to discuss the court, the justices, and particularly the confirmation process, it will attract all or most of our attention, and we may lose the possibility of at least a different view. And of course, we're going to have a wonderful discussion of the court anyway. 
Uh, after all, the court decides fewer than 75 cases a year out of the nearly 360,000 federal criminal and civil cases, and nearly half of the court's cases are decided unanimously, or nearly so, and without sub substantial controversy. If we consider that over 100 million cases are filed in the state courts each year, a different focus for our inquiry starts to take shape. This is a staggering number of interactions between our fellow Americans and their judges and court systems, interactions that dwarf in number and sometimes personal consequences their experience of the Supreme Court and indeed the entire federal court system. I certainly acknowledge that the court is most important to this discussion because of its leadership role, because of the enduring salience of certain questions that appear on the court's docket, like abortion, and because it is easy to forget that the Supreme Court is rather unique in many ways and not characteristic of most judging in this country. My second story is about a debate I had with Judge Richard Posner a few years ago at Northwestern Law School. He had published his book, How Judges Think, and I had reviewed it somewhat critically. At the end of the debate, he turned to me and said, or asked, does Dean Levy seriously think that it would make any difference if Republican appointed judges wore red robes and Democratic appointed judges wore blue robes? I said, it would make a huge difference and it would be terrible. And he responded, that just doesn't cut it. Well, he got the last word, but I don't think he was right. Judge Posner was probably thinking of the Supreme Court, possibly of the federal appellate courts, and I think his point was that, well, everyone knows the party of the appointing president, and so what's the big deal? The color of the robe shouldn't add any information or have any additional effect. And my point was that for judges to consider or present themselves as of different political teams by wearing the team's jersey, and for the, appearance, the experience of parties and lawyers to see judges so arrayed would be highly destructive of the reality and appearance of fair and impartial nonpartisan courts. The reality and the appearance are in a constant feedback loop, and we need to consider both in any discussion of independent and fair courts. Here is how I have organized my talk this morning. I begin by addressing why fair and, and impartial courts are important. I look back at the framers and distill certain postulates about what makes for fair and impartial courts. Spoiler alert, the framers were right. I then explore three related topics that bear on this discussion. Judicial discretion and judgment, the assertion that judges are no better than politicians in black robes, and the complexity added to the discussion of judicial decision making by judicial analytics and legal realism. I then turned to three threats to judicial independence and to fair and impartial judging. Each of these threats is mainly to the independence of our state courts and state judges, and each runs directly counter to the vision of the framers as they structured the federal courts. Let's start at the beginning and with first principles. Maybe it is too obvious to even ask the question, but why are fair and impartial courts important and how does judicial independence figure in? President Gutman gave a very good explanation for this. If you are an originalist, the answer is easy. The framers and the ratifiers considered that a fair and impartial judiciary, one that followed the law and was not biased, partisan, intimidated, or seeking preferment, was central to a Republican form of government. They believed that judicial independence was critical to fairness and impartiality. They thought of judicial independence in two facets, the decisional independence of the judge from outside pressure or inducements when deciding a case, and the independence of the judicial branch as a whole as a separate branch of three. The Declaration of Independence prominently featured the King's attacks on both the judicial branch and the individual judge in its Bill of Particulars. He has obstructed the administration of justice by refusing his assent to laws for establishing judiciary powers, and he has made judge, judges dependent on his will alone for the tenure of their office and the amount and payment of their salaries. The founders were steeped in Montesquieu and other thinkers of the late 17th and early 18th century, 
and they came to believe that a fair and impartial judiciary was only possible where it embodied in a separate judicial branch and were the judges protected in their tenure and compensation. Article three of the Constitution reflects this view. It provides for a separate branch of judges who themselves are insulated from pressure by lifetime tenure during good behavior and by a guaranteed livelihood. The framers did not provide that the judges would be entirely divorced from the ebb and flow of political life. They could be impeached and their initial appointment was through the political branches. Nor were they autonomous. They were confined by law and by the assent of the other branches. Moreover, for much of their activity, they would be sharing the judicial power with citizens through the jury trial, which has such a prominent places in the Bill of Rights and our traditions. Federalist 78 by Hamilton celebrated the separation of powers and the independent judiciary in language well known to this audience, never gets old. Hamilton famously said, the judiciary has no influence over either the sword or the purse, no direction either of the strength or of the wealth of the society and can take no active resolution whatever. It may truly be said to have neither force nor will, but merely judgment and must ultimately depend upon the aid of the executive arm, even for the efficacy of its judgments. And he said, as liberty can have nothing to fear from the judiciary alone, it would have everything to fear from its union with either of the other departments, which is why separation and independence were so important. Hamilton's comments speak to us even now. Judges should not by party or for any other reason be united to the other branches, nor should they be involved on their own initiative and authority in the redirection of the wealth of the society. Hamilton understood that the judicial spirit of independence, the judicial culture, would be essential to the arduous task of resisting encroachments by the other branches. He also understood that judges would exercise discretion, but that there was a distinction between the exercise of discretion and judgment and the guided, I'm sorry, that there was a distinction between the exercise of judgment and the guided exercise of discretion on the one hand and the imposition of personal will and preference on the other. He saw the importance of courageous judges to the preservation of individual liberty and to the amelioration of oppressive legislation. Judges in this republic, protected by life tenure, would unite integrity and fortitude to wisdom and knowledge of the law. And this knowledge of and fealty to the law gained through practice and study would be the bulwark over judicial overreaching. Even if the authority of the founding generation were not enough, it seems that in fact and over time, their beliefs have proven themselves. Indeed, and I have this on good authority, it is not possible to have a successful democracy without a fair and impartial judiciary. And it is not possible to have a fair and impartial judiciary that lacks independence in both of its aspects. Are there examples of successful democracy where the judicial function is dependent or subsumed in the other branches such that the judicial branch lacks institutional independence? Are there successful democracies where the judges lack decisional independence but are routinely subject to pressure or external command or inducement? The answer is no. Americans need to have faith in the independence, fairness, and impartiality of our judges because they look to the courts as the, pl as the place where they can get a fair shake, whether their complaint is with the government or a business or a neighbor or a landlord. That is a huge entrustment which brings us here today. I draw the following principles or assertions from what I have covered so far. First, fair and impartial courts are essential to a, su a successful democracy. Second, judicial independence is not for the personal benefit of the judicial officer, but so that the judiciary may be fair and impartial. Third, there are two primary aspects to judicial independence, decisional and institutional. Fourth, the selection, compensation, and tenure of judicial officers is important to their independence. Fifth, the judicial culture, the independent spirit of the judiciary, as Hamilton put it, is critical. Judges must be careful to guard the culture and be true to it. 
Sixth, the judiciary must not be in league with either of the other branches and must not supplant the role of those branches or in turn be supplanted by them. Seventh, while there must be separation, there must also be collaboration. The judiciary depends heavily on the other branches for its support, the execution of its orders, and the substance and procedures of the law itself. We consider that judicial independence serves the rule of law, but this is only the case if the judiciary's rulings command assent and respect, and if the substance of the law and the prescribed procedures are consistent with our common sense of justice and fair play. In other words, the ecology of judging is important and depends mainly on the other branches. And finally, we acknowledge that the appearance of fairness and impartiality is almost as important as the reality, and the two are not easily separated. Much flows from these principles, and when we depart from them, we put ourselves at risk. There are three further aspects to this discussion that I think deserve elaboration. Judicial discretion and judgment, the distinction between policy making and partisanship, and the impact of legal realism and academic studies of judicial decision making on the perception of judging. I begin with judicial discretion and judgment. I use the terms together to encompass the kind of judicial decision, such as the imposition of a sentence, where the law gives the judge a range of options, options and choices or relies on the judge's assessment of the circumstances in drawing further conclusions. As well, the terms discretion and judgment encompass the law making and law clarification that occurs when judges apply existing rules and precedents to new facts situations or when they reevaluate and refine precedents in the light of subsequent cases and circumstances. If judges had no discretion and no call for the exercise of judgment, then much of this discussion would be unnecessary. If the law were so specific and so determinate that any of us would reach the same conclusions and quickly on any point of law or exercise of judicial power, then a computer could now do the job of the judge even without further advancements in artificial intelligence and machine learning. We would not need judges who are learned or courageous or blessed with powerful intellect or common sense or humility or integrity or a deep commitment to equal justice. None of that would be relevant, nor would judges be criticized or find themselves under attack were they merely applying matrices and highly specific rules and codes. But that is not our system or aspiration. Our judges, state and federal, trial and appellate, exercise discretion and judgment, and the American people know it and let us hope appreciate it at least some of the time. But, and this is my second point, the exercise of some degree of discretion and judgment inevitably opens up the judiciary to criticism, to the criticism that judges are partisans or politicians in black robes. Some critics of the courts conflate the kind of restrained policy making that judges must do with partisanship or the practice of politics. This criticism fundamentally misunderstands what it is that judges do. When judges exercise discretion and judgment, they will often find it necessary to consider practical consequences and the overall context of a matter. These considerations may affect any number of decisions from case management to specific fact findings to the to development of the law through its application. But the consideration of practical consequences and policies inherent to the law or a situation is not the same as partisanship or the practice of politics. As our distinguished colleague, Judge Michael Boudin, has explained so well, leeway is often present in cases in which public policy issues are at stake. Judges ought to put aside personal preferences, but they can hardly avoid bringing a worldview to the choices that many such cases present. To call judges' subsequent choices in public policy cases political is mere provocation. Policy often matters in deciding cases, but it is usually policy attributable to Congress 
or to public policy reflected in case law, common sense, and the values of the community. Judge Boudin calls upon us to be more careful in how we describe what judges do and how we use the loaded term political. The challenge is to make clear the distinction between the proper and improper exercise of discretion and judgment between appropriate policy considerations and inappropriate partisanship. This explanation, and now I move to my final topic in this set, will be somewhat complicated by the new era of judicial analytics in which there is such a focus on the tendencies and track records of individual judges or of groups of judges grouped by some characteristic of the judge, such as age, race, education, or the political party of the appointing president or governor. How do we explain to our fellow Americans that judges are fair and impartial and open-minded when, for example, the academic study of judicial decision-making has found persuasive correlations between the political party of the appointing authority and the judge's decisions on certain issues? Of course, we should not find such correlations surprising. Presidents and governors often openly look for lawyers to appoint as judges who have had certain kinds of experiences, for example, as prosecutors or who have expressed certain views on matters of legal policy. Voters in judicial elections will sometimes choose a judicial candidate who, for example, presents as tough on crime. But then why would we expect the judges, that judges chosen for these reasons, once in office, would be identical to other judges in outlook or judicial philosophy who were chosen for different reasons. And there will be other factors that academic studies will show significant in some group of cases. For example, the gender or age or education of the judge. The hard part is to explain why judges may be considered fair and impartial and open-minded, even though in some cases they will decide differently than other judges according to criteria like appointing authority or gender that we can track and that are immutable. In the new era of judicial analytics, which has dawned, all of us, including judges, will be painfully aware of every statistic for every judicial officer, from how long the judge takes to resolve a certain type of motion, to how different law firms seem to fare before the judge, from how the judge sentences for particular crimes to whether the judge sentences men more severely than women, the list will go on and on and on. One may hope that this kind of data will assist judges, but is, it is not hard to see serious pitfalls. For example, will judges start to curate their data and be influenced in the decision of future cases? Perhaps for this reason, earlier this, this year, France made it a felony to publish judge-specific analytics for the purpose or result of evaluating, analyzing, or predicting their actual or supposed professional practices. Uh, this law is shocking, uh, but the underlying problem is real enough and has been of concern to others, including the United States Sentencing Commission. While we must defend our judges against the charge that they are nothing but politicians in robes, we must and should acknowledge the judges are human beings in robes, selected by political actors, and they will exercise discretion and judgment in different ways. Perhaps this may seem unfair to particular litigants in particular cases, even though the different judicial perspectives benefit the system as a whole. We should not shy away from addressing this topic, which must cause, inevitably, some uneasiness. I turn now to what I identify as the three most pressing threats to judicial independence and to fair and impartial judging. First, the commandeering of our local courts by local police and revenue authorities. Second, the possibility that judges themselves will get drawn into partisan battles, thereby losing their detachment and the appearance of impartiality. And third, the election of state court judges in so many of our states. I begin where the rubber meets the road at the lowest level of our state courts in the local and municipal courts. This is where most of our fellow citizens experience their justice system. The riveting and truly appalling Department of Justice report on the police department of Ferguson, Missouri 
highlighted that in Ferguson, the municipal court had been commandeered by the city and the police and turned into a vehicle of oppression. According to the report, the municipal court's primary purpose was to generate revenue for the city. It did so by adopting procedures that made it difficult for the defendant to pay a fine or traffic offense, requiring personal appearances during the workday, prolonging the cases, and stacking additional fines and fees for failure to meet these unduly oppressive procedural requirements. Arrest warrants and driver's license suspensions automatically followed upon the failure to pay enhanced fees and fines, leading to yet additional fees and fines, missed days at work, and violations of court orders. By these means, the courts colluded in the creation of a destitution pipeline for many people, many of whom are poor and minority. Ultimately, the court system entirely lost the confidence of the people it served, forfeiting its role as an administer of justice for that of a revenue collector. Many of our states have this same problem. In Texas, $1 billion in revenue is raised by lower courts in this regressive fashion. In California, the figure is $2 billion. Recall that Hamilton explained that it is not the business of the courts to redirect the wealth of the community. It is not the job of the courts to balance city budgets on the backs of the poor. Surely all government bounty systems by which government agencies fund themselves through fees, fines, and for forfeitures ultimately lead to overreaching and due process violations, whatever the level of government. But I highlight this issue today not as a problem of good government or of particular penalties gone awry or mandatory penalties causing injustice in particular circumstances. I highlight it because our municipal officials, by depriving our local court systems of their independence and separateness, have created the very unfairness and tyranny that Hamilton warned about so long ago. This estrangement of whole communities from their courts is happening across the country. I would be remiss if I did not mention that the response of our state chief justices to this problem, once it became visible, has been extraordinary and a powerful example of judicial leadership. The Conference of Chief Justices formed a national task force which has developed principles and model statutes that local courts and administrators may use to address the issue of fees, fines, and exorbitant money bail. The problem has by no means been solved, but thanks to these judicial officers, it will no longer be ignored. My second threat begins with the observation that many institutions that strive to neutrality and principled decision making are under pressure and attack right now. Foundations, universities, and professional associations, the Federal Reserve, and the courts themselves find themselves drawn into controversies, often symbolic, that seemingly blow up overnight. Of course, judges should not complain of thoughtful criticism, whether of particular opinions or of court services and performance. But much of the criticism is not of this purpose or content or tone. And we are in a new era of social media in which interlocking networks may be mobilized and on the march in an instant. I have had some experience in responding to these kinds of attacks through my association with several well-established institutions, and the line, do not try this yourself at home, comes to mind. <laughs> Most of us have no experience or expertise in this kind of communications and crisis management. There's a whole field of professionals who handle this kind of thing and can help guide the response. And the first response is just the beginning. The entity wishes to explain and put the controversy to rest, but the opponent's goal is just the reverse. It will churn out emails, blog posts, fundraising appeals, and generally wear out the exclamation mark and the all caps keys. <laughs> Against this background, I read with some concern that an ABA committee I formally chaired, the Standing Committee on the American Judicial System, held a conference on judicial independence at which several esteemed judges, state and federal, exhorted their judicial colleagues to speak out and defend themselves when attacked by political figures and other groups for particular decisions. I do not agree with this approach. 
judges are neophytes and in innocents in this harsh world of social media combat. There are significant dangers here. Because judges do not have crisis managers and communication specialists, they are at risk of saying the wrong thing in the wrong way and in the wrong place. They even risk offending some of their own colleagues and creating rifts within a court if they say too much or too little or not quite the right language or tone. And there is the appearance. When a judge squares off outside the courtroom against a president or a governor or some other political person or entity, may the public be forgiven if it sees a partisan judge. But more subtle and equally important is the risk to their own heart and soul, to the judge's spirit of detachment, moderation, fairness, and impartiality. Responding to criticism can become a full-time preoccupation. A judge's response may engender an even more bitter and unfair response, motions to recuse, and the like. Now, this kind of conflict is distasteful to most judges, but not so to the critics. If judges enter the ring, they risk changing who they are. They may deprive themselves of the detachment and equanimity that are necessary to great judging. I know this situation is frustrating and deeply disturbing to many judges. The possible threats to family members are frightening. It does take courage and restraint in this environment to carry on without bitterness and with a steady adherence to equal justice. Fortunately, we have great examples of judges doing just that, now as before. At least for those judges who have lifetime tenure and guaranteed compensation, the framers foresaw the likelihood of conflict and strove to protect our judges from the corrosive effects of partisan competition. But they knew it would still require courage to be a judge in our raucous republic. Now it is up to, to us, to the bar of this country. The profession must put in many more resources to explaining what judges do and defending them from unfair and political attacks. While judges don't have crisis managers and social media experts, other groups do. It is distressing that in recent years we have seen the demise of two leading organizations most devoted to judicial independence, the American Judicature Society, which was a wonderful organization, and Justice at Stake, which Justice O'Connor was so committed to, as well as the defunding of the one American Bar Association Committee dedicated to judicial independence. Our bar associations should realize that one of the main reasons lawyering is a profession is precisely so that an independent bar may defend the independence of the judiciary. We can do much, much better and keep our judges out of the fray. This doesn't mean that there's nothing that judges can do. They can do so much, obviously, but not by responding to specific attacks. It's too late by then. Judges can and do connect with their communities by holding court in high schools and other places, by giving talks on the rule of law, uh, on how judges decide cases and the importance of judicial independence. They can speak about how they do their work and what their aspirations are, how they became a judge and how they try to keep the public's confidence. They can articulate their rulings so that a person of reasonable education and intelligence can understand the reasoning. Every opinion is an opportunity for civic education on the role of the judge. This kind of important work is happening every day by judges inside and outside of the courthouse. Justice Kennedy and, and Judge Rendell are such inspirational examples of what a justice or a judge can do to explain the judicial role in preserving the rule of law. And there are many other judges in this room who do this all of the time, and they are heroes. My third and last threat to address is the challenge to fair and impartial courts presented by state judicial elections. I defer to the next speakers on this topic and will say just a very few words. For, for state court elections, the problem in my view is not that the process ends up with unqualified or substandard judges. We have many wonderful state court judges who have been chosen and retained through election systems. There are also some benefits to judicial elections. For example, 
they are opportunities for civic education and outreach. But the negatives are many. First, when one of the occasional contested and nasty elections occurs, a lot of damaging and misleading accusations will be made about judges, the judicial role, and the courts. Second, academic studies demonstrate that judges facing re-election will be affected in their judicial decisions in the time period running up to the election. State trial judges sentence more severely, appellate judges are less likely to overturn a conviction, and Supreme Court justices are less likely to overturn a death penalty. This is shocking. Third, partisan judicial elections are utterly inconsistent with our effort to convince the public that our judges are not partisans. Even were it possible to run as a Republican or Democratic judge wearing the team's jersey and then become a nonpartisan judge in a black robe until the next election cycle, the electorate may be forgiven for disbelieving in this alchemy. Finally, judicial campaigns require money and organization, and judges naturally turn to lawyers and their business clients for assistance, lawyers and clients who may appear before the very same judge. Surely we can ameliorate some of these negative consequences. I reflect in closing that more than anything, we must preserve the judicial culture in this country. If the judicial culture is strong, then whatever the threats, we will have fair and impartial judges animated by the spirit of independence. They will aspire to be wise, courageous, open-minded, thoughtful, and considerate. As Learned Hand explained some 75 years ago, liberty lies in the hearts of men and women. When it dies there, no constitution, no law, no court can save it. The same may be said of judicial independence, fairness, and impartiality. I marvel today, as I have my entire legal career, at the excellence of our judiciaries, state and federal. Despite low salaries, threats to judicial independence, and sometimes burdensome caseload, our state and federal judges are among the unsung heroes of the Republic, as Justice Jackson might put it, jewels of the crown in our democracy. There is some miracle at work here, difficult to explain, but wonderful to behold. May it always be so. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Levy, very much. Good morning, I'm Eleanor Barrett, the Associate Dean for Curricular Affairs here at Penn Law School and a former law clerk of Judge Rendell. Um, welcome to you all again. Our next panel, as we've heard, is going to be an assemblage that the judges put together for us of civic experts on state and local, or in, and federal courts. Um, and they're gonna be introduced by their moderator, Lynn Marks, but I'd like to say a few words about Ms. Marks before we begin. Uh, Ms. Marks is a graduate of this great law school. Um, she also is a longtime advocate for access to justice as well as court reforms. For many years, she led, Pennsylva she led uh, Pennsylvanians for modern courts, um, and she continues to do work on civic education um, and teaching a class at Temple University's Continuing Education School for Adults with Judge Phyllis Beck, who I believe is also in our audience. Uh, so welcome with me, please. Um, Ms. Marks and our panelists on the state and federal judiciary. sure they will be here any minute. <laughs> I did not want to miss a word of Dean Levy's remarks, so I stayed inside here.
morning. Thank you to Judge Randell and to all the organizers and uh, planners of this conference for really putting together a, a, a group of, um, of legal rock stars. And this panel um, is really an all-star panel, and I encourage you to read their full biographies. I'm just going to give you a very short identification of each of them. Um, our, this is on federal uh, versus state. Uh, judge McKee is uh, the federal court on the panel, a uh, federal court judge. He serves on the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit, and he served as the chief judge for more than six years. Uh, uh, to my right is uh, our state court judge, uh, Judge Renee Cohn Jubilier, and she serves on the Pennsylvania Commonwealth Court, which is one of our two uh, intermediate appellate courts and relevant to today. She is the co-chair of the Pennsylvania Commission on Judicial Independence, one of the sponsors of today's program. Uh, in the middle here is uh, our lawyer. Uh, Bob Heim is a nationally recognized trial lawyer who practices in federal and state court. And relevant to today, he is a co-founder and current board chair of Pennsylvanians for Modern Courts. Um, my name is Lynn Marks, and I'm going to serve as your moderator. Uh, we encourage you to write down questions, and if we have time, we will um, discuss them. Um, here is a very, very brief primer on how judges are selected uh, for those who are not familiar. As you heard from previous speakers on the federal level, uh, Article 3 of the U.S. Constitution states that uh, the, the president nominates uh, federal judges. They are confirmed by the Senate, and they serve for good behavior, which is typically for life. Uh, state court judges are selected in a variety of ways. Uh, election, either partisan or nonpartisan. Uh, appointment, uh, usually by the governor, either without a nominating commission or with the nominating commission, which is often referred to as merit selection. Uh, a, a appointment by the legislature, all that, fortunately, that is very uncommon, uh, or a combination of these methods, such as uh, an appointment and then an election, and then some states have uh, a different method for uh, picking uh, uh, trial court judges or appellate court judges. Uh, selection is usually for a given number of years, depending on the state, uh, very occasionally for life, uh, years ago, I heard somebody from the American Judicature Society to just, who described state judicial selection systems as like snowflakes, that no two are alike. But today, when we talk about state courts, we're going to be focused on Pennsylvania. And in Pennsylvania, uh, trial and appellate uh, court judges are um, chosen in partisan elections, which means that people run on a party line the term is usually for 10 years, and then after 10 years will uh, uh, stand for what's called a retention election where the voters can decide yes or no whether that judge deserves to stay for a full 10-year term, uh, and then so on. So there are many topics that we could have uh, focused on with the state versus federal uh, uh, program head. We decided to focus on judicial selection and tenure, public perception of the courts and judicial independence versus accountability. And the previous speakers really are a wonderful uh, introduction to this panel. OK, let's get going. And remember, we decided we weren't going to have any long speeches, right? OK. <laughs> um, OK, so we're going to start with federal judge, with Judge McKee. And you are in a rare situation of having uh, both served on the federal court uh, at the appeals level and on the state court at the trial level. So having lived through and succeeded in uh, uh, getting to both of those courts, I wondered if you would uh, share, um, compare the, the processes, particularly with an eye towards today's topic, fair and impartial courts. Thank you, and I'd be happy to. Both systems, we call it merit selection, and they're those who argue for elected judges would probably say that that's also a merit selection process and the, the you know, people who are casting the ballots um, determine who is most meritorious, but hopefully we're in this room beyond the point where we would accept that. 
Um, but both systems do involve an element of politics. And if, if we don't accept that, I think we're deluding ourselves. Both the so-called merit selection system that we have in the federal level and the uh, local system, and I use Pennsylvania as an example, where you run by popular election, uh, both are, are very heavy political. Unfortunately, the federal, se federal system has even gotten more political lately. Um, having said that, I will say, however, that electing judges by popular election is an absolutely horrible way to select judges. It's an abomination. There's not much really good I can say about it. The only thing that the voter cares about uh, are basically the things that you can't talk about. So when you go to ward meetings, which is a whole other topic, um, you ask questions which you can't answer. And those are, of course, the only things that the people in that room want to know, how you would vote on certain things that impact them. But those are things that might come before you, so you can't answer the, the question. The problem is, and this was alluded to earlier, that all of us derive our authority really from the acceptance uh, of the uh, public. It's, uh, we don't have the power of the person or the sword, as sort of was, was mentioned earlier. There has to be a culture of compliance and acceptance within the uh, community for judges to do our job. And to the extent that we are seen as not being fair and impartial, the judiciary is seriously undermined and weakened. Electing judges, I think, only goes to undermine that perception. One of the problems is raising money. Uh, I was lucky when I ran in, when did I run? 84, I think I ran, 84. Uh, it wasn't at the point that it is now, um, that's at least in Philadelphia, totally out of hand, even at the local common police court money uh, level with raising the money. Um, one example I will give you that happened to me, and this is, I think, not that atypical in terms of how the, quote, merit selection of the public um, election works. Right before I ran for election, when I was running for election, I was fortunate enough to be general counsel of the local um, quasi-governmental authority, which is not unfairly known as a patronage haven. Everybody there was a ward leader or a committee person. And one of the persons who worked next to me, who was the ward leader from a very conservative, all-white, um, I wouldn't say racist, but um, hostile, as I could say that, <laughs> Uh, area of the city called me into his office one day and he says, McGee, which is what he always called me, McGee, uh, I'm going to support you for a judge. And I said, well, gee, thank you. Uh, he says, yeah, you're the only colored, colored guy I ever supported for anything. I said, well, geez, that's, that's a great thing. <laughs> <laughs> he said, but there's one thing I want to ask of you. And I thought, well, my here it comes. And I'd, I'd been a federal prosecutor for a few years and I thought, well, how am I going to deal with this situation? Because I assume here comes the, the, the arm twisting. Well, what he said was, I want you to stay out of, out of my ward. I don't want you to go to any ward meetings. And I said, I want to go to anyhow. So I said, well, that's fine. I'm, I'm happy to do that. And he said, yeah, see, I got an all Irish ward. Your name is McKee. I'm going to run you as an Irish guy. <laughs> so, and I can get you votes. But if you come into my ward and folks see that you're a colored guy, one, you're not going to get any votes. And I'm going to lose my ward share. So you got to stay out of my ward. He said, oh, so I'll be happy to do that. So I, I got 800 votes out of his ward. In the next few, several days, people were calling me saying, McKee, Ted, how in the hell did you get 800 votes out of that board? The first time someone called, unfortunately, I was honest, and I told them that story. Then I thought, you know, I could have some fun here. So everybody else who called, there were about three or four people who called, including the person who won the mayoral election that year. I said, well, you know, I went to the board meeting, and I read some carefully selected excerpts from the Federalist Papers, and I think it resonated with the... <laughs> With the committee people. But, but anyhow, that's one small example in my life, but it shows you how incredibly arbitrary electing judges um, can be. The key to having a fair and impartial judiciary is not uh, the process that we use necessarily, but building a public respect and understanding for what judges do in the rule, rule of law and, and valuing it. But it's not just building that amongst our elect uh, people who cast the vote. vote. I submit to you that unless our elected officials, those persons who in the so-called merit selection systems are responsible for appointing judges, unless there's a respect there in evaluating for the role of the judiciary and the importance of a fair and independent judiciary, we are in a lot of trouble. And absent that, I'd suggest to you, if we focus too much on the selection process, it's tantamount to just tinkering with the chairs on board the deck of the Titanic. We're not going to make any change. We're going to rearrange the furniture. I think the process that we have Having a good process is a necessary but not sufficient way of getting a fair and impartial judiciary. And unless that process rests on something, and I would submit that's the public respect for what we do, it's on a very, very shaky foundation. Oh, thank you, Judge McGee. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Does anybody want to respond to that? I, I'd just like to make a, a comment or two about what Judge McKee said. Um, you know, the, I don't think there's any question that the federal system works better, not perfectly, and I don't think anybody would say that there, there are no politics in the federal selection process, but there are checks and balances along the way, and, and for a long time, most presidents, uh, most, by far most presidents, uh, would rely on, uh, they, they knew who they wanted to nominate, the, they got input from the two senators from the, the state, both of whom generally had committees, uh, to determine whether the candidate was really, the, these were the right candidates to put forward. And then the ABA Selection Committee, or uh, the Committee on Judicial Selection, and I served on it for a number of years, uh, would do an interview with whomever seemed to emerge from that, a very detailed interview, an FBI uh, check, and, uh, and then a report to the president uh, from the ABA on whether the person was uh, highly qualified, qualified, or not qualified. And in every instance I saw, when there was a recommendation that came out from the ABA that said, sorry, uh, Mr. President, but this, this candidate just is not qualified to sit on the district court or one of our appellate courts, uh, that was respected by the president. In every instance, it was respected. Now, the problem with the state judiciary is, uh, what is it, a five? I think the big problem is uh, a five-letter word, which is money. Um, it, I think, will shock you to know that in the last run-up, the 2015 election for Supreme Court justices, the amount of money that was raised was $21 million that went into to, um, funding candidates, $21 million. Uh, $15 million were raised by the candidates themselves. There was gray money, there was dark money. I mean, you know, it's the, the idea, and I don't blame the judges for the, 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 the individuals who were running for the appellate seats for the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. This was the system. Uh, nobody knew who they were. Uh, nobody knows who any of the judges are that are running for election. Um, and this was the game they were in, so they raised money. And of course, where does the money come from? It comes from special interest groups who think, whether it's right or wrong, but they think that they can influence how judges decide cases um, and that they, this judge will be likely to be much more receptive to their policy interests than some other judge. And that's why you get $21 million getting put into the, into the election. On the trial level, uh, in, in many ways it's even worse. Every, no one knows who the 15 or 20 trial judges are who are running. Uh, and, and it's not so much a problem with, many, uh, with money there, it's how well you did when you drew your ballot position and what your name was. And uh, similar to Judge McKee, I remember uh, one year there was a, a very popular and famous nightclub owner in Philadelphia named Frank Palumbo. And uh, everybody loved uh, Mr. Palumbo. So there was a fellow running for a trial judge seat whose name was Palumbo. And he was the only one in that uh, election who had been rated unqualified by the Philadelphia Bar Association. Of course, he came in first. <laughs> and he, was the, he came in number one in, in this. So He also had the first ballot position. He did, he had both. But, um, and, and the other problem I think that Judge McKee talks about is one that um, Judge Spaeth, who, who many of us revere and who wrote this wonderful book, The Constitution's Vision of a Just Society. I remember him telling us once that when he ran statewide, he would uh, go to these meetings, and I think you were referring to this, Ted, and um, people would come up to him and say, uh, so Judge, how would you vote on this particular issue? And the judge, Judge Spaeth, would say, well, I, I really can't talk about that. I'm not permitted in Pennsylvania to tell you how I would vote, and I would have to know the facts and the law. And the person would look at him and give him a wink and say, <laughs> okay, now really, how would you vote on this? And Judge Spaeth said he found himself being winked at all across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. <laughs> so real, prob very common, very real problems with this system. I'll wait. You wait? Marks. 
Okay, okay, we're gonna change gears um, a little bit. Um, this is for Bob Heim as a litigator in federal court and state court, and actually, a, and as a, a passionate um, advocate for fair and impartial courts. Um, can you talk um, a little bit about public perception of the courts? And Judge Randall really gave us a, a start by talking about one of the surveys that's out now. Yeah, I, I think the surveys are fascinating, particularly the Annenberg uh, survey, and I think all of you have that in, in your package. Um, it's no surprise, I think, to anyone in this audience that uh, in various surveys, I think there have been three or four in the last couple of years, uh, the judiciary always ranks the highest in terms of respect than the other two, um, uh, the other two bodies, the legislature or the executive. The, the judiciary gets much better marks for competence and and um, and, and just integrity, and uh, it just uh, uh, does very very well. Um, but you know, given the state of affairs, why wouldn't you come out that way? But the um, you know, my, my own view is that uh, the perception of the judiciary has eroded in recent years. Um, uh, I think, um, you know, some people think it started with Bush v. Gore, where the five R's came one way and the five, four D's came the other way, but I, I don't think so. I think the country got past uh, any, of the, any of that uh, kind of, uh, accusations of, of political bias, and, and we, we survived that reasonably well. Um, but, uh, but in recent years, you know, the, the references to Obama judges and Bush judges and the like, despite uh, our chief justices, I thought, valiant effort to speak out publicly, which is always hard, I think, for a, a justice or a chief justice to do, but d despite that, I think, uh, there is a sense, um, and I think it is supported by the Annenberg survey that you have in your package, that the, um, the, the respect for the judiciary has, has eroded somewhat. Um, you now see candidates for the presidency suggesting that we enlarge the Supreme Court to, uh, from nine to, I think, 14, or term limits for appellate judges or Supreme Court uh, justices. And while that may have floated around before, I don't really remember it being talked about as, as much as it is. Um, and uh, I think Judge Rundell mentioned the, the survey response in Annenberg, but the one that troubled me most, the response that you have in your package that troubled me most, was the one uh, response where half of the respondents uh, said that uh, they thought judges did not rise above their own um, political biases or personal beliefs in deciding cases. That really troubled me because that's really the, 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 the heart of, of an independent judiciary, that judges will do just exactly that, that they're beholden only, only to the law. Um, and I, I think, um, I think that's a very troubling result, and I would guess that it's pretty much consistent among all, the, all of the surveys that get done nationally. Uh, it's very worrisome to me because um, I think uh, Dr. Gutman said it pretty well. You know, it's, it's not enough. It really is not enough for, um, to, for judges to be fair. Uh, it's, just as important that, that our courts and our judges, our justices be perceived as being fair. And when that doesn't happen, I think we all lose something. Uh, so I, I think, um, I think we're, we're in a darker spot right now than we have been in a long time with regard to the perception of the judiciary. And, how we're going to deal with that and how we're going to confront that um, is something that I think should be important to everybody here. Do you think you want to respond or not? Well, I just kind of pick up on that. I'm not sure the public understands how incredibly difficult it is, it is for us to do our, our jobs. There have been a couple of cases that I've had decide that came out in a way that were totally was antithetical 
for the way I thought a, quote, just result would um, force me to go, but the law was clear, the precedents were clear. Fortunately, I had no seniority. I could assign the opinion to myself and keep it very, very narrow and not um, do too much what I would consider damage in the writing of it. But I did not like the result, but I had no choice. Uh, and I remember, I think I had been on the court maybe only two months, and one of my colleagues came down who uh, shared my concerns about the death penalty. And she had just been on a panel and decided that there was a uh, death penalty case, and she had to vote to uphold the sentence of death. She sat down on a sofa, and I didn't know her all that well at the time. We became incredibly good friends after that. She actually began to cry. And she said, you know, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to sleep tonight. I, I, I hate what I just did, but I've, um, I had no choice. And we talked for a little bit about it. She knew that I shared her concerns about the death penalty. And I've had those experiences myself, in one case where I had to uh, do an opinion overturning the grant of, a writ of habeas, because I just thought there was no intellectually honest way to say this person, if you're going to have the death penalty, that, that, that doesn't apply here. And, and the public really doesn't quite get that. So when I hear things like that survey, uh, it really is disheartening because that is the hardest thing we have to do is try to be faithful to that rule of law. And, and, and the, the borderline shifts, obviously, and in some areas you have more leeway than others, depending on the large uh, interstices, how big the interstices are between the law and the statutes that control. But for the most part, I think with any court, the Supreme Court or any circuit court, if you take the quote, most conservative and the most liberal person on that court, and gave them a sample of 100 cases, and probably 99% of the time you get everyone agreeing because the law is pretty clear as to what you had to do, but the public doesn't see that aspect of it. They see the aspect where there might be a, a political divide or a case that gets sensationalized, and it's, it's oftentimes very disheartening that I just don't think the, the folks get it or appreciate it. And all the more, um reason that what the Rendell Center is doing is important so people can understand really the role of a judge and that you're not there, Judge McGee, to, you know, just to say what you personally feel. Okay, let's, we're going to move on um, for a question for Judge Cohn uh, Jubilee. Um, this audience is more knowledgeable than most groups, but even so, my hunch is that many of us still struggle with, with what um, judicial accountability means, accountability to whom, accountability to what. And so if you could talk about that and also briefly talk about the tension between judicial independence and judicial accountability. Yes. Thank you very much. And it's a real honor to be here with this esteemed panel. And of course, thank you, Judge Rendell, for um, inviting us here and, and your staff for putting this together. Um, discussing such a broad question and recognizing the level and depth of expertise of this audience is, is very challenging. Um, I was elected, um, my only experience has been in state court. I was elected in a partisan um, statewide election in 2001 and then stood, we call it standing, for um, a merit retention in 2011 and then of course have um, an opportunity in a couple years hopefully to stand again. So. Um, let me first put a, a little context to the conversation. Um, and as uh, President Gutman said before, approximately 90% of the United States judicial business is handled by state courts. And approximately nine out of 10 state court judges face voters in some type of election. Pennsylvania, like other states, began with appointed judges and did not elect judges until 1850. Around this time, there was a national movement to judicial elections, arguably part of the Jacksonian era of democracy. You know, a distrust of unrepresentation, fear of unaccountable government officers, and a belief that judges could function as a check and balance of the other branches, only if independent of them and not appointed by them. Um, and you can think of this as institutional um, independence, as uh, Dean Levy had talked about. And in fact, early state judges nationwide um, did not use, um, curtailed their use of judicial review in order to avoid conflict with legislatures from the founding until about 1830s. Um, and so there was a concern about judges being beholden, if you will, to those who appointed them. Um, after Pennsylvania went to their election system, debate began shortly thereafter and has continued, of course, until today, not only about who initially selects the judges and through what 
process and um, to continue with an Alexander Hamilton reference, who can be in the room where it happens, um, but also how long judges should serve and how they will be reselected or retained. Um, re -sele selecting and retaining a fair and impartial judiciary requires um, competent, qualified judges who are able to interpret and apply the law free of improper influence, political or other pressures or inducements, kind of decisional independence, um, while not exceeding the proper limits of judicial authority, whatever those are, and which can be referred to as accountability. And the goal, I guess, has been to find um, and maintain um, or a balance to maintain public confidence in a fair and impartial judiciary. The federal courts and some state courts like Pennsylvania have chosen different systems to meet that goal. More than 10 years ago, I was in line uh, to vote in a municipal election and a woman came in um, saying very excited and passionately she was there to vote that day because she wanted to vote to be able to keep voting for judges. Now at the time, as I mentioned, there has been, you know, obviously discussion about changing the system in Pennsylvania and she thought it was on the ballot. Of course, it was not. But um, that story really sticks with me because when you also look at surveys and you see the state of our states, the public, by and large, wants to be able to continue to elect their judges. And um, given some of the concerns, um, you know, and, and I see there are both advantages and disadvantages to the systems that we have. But um, let me just um, throw out a couple ideas, since I'm the state elected judge. Um, as was mentioned before, um, elections are opportunities. And when I traveled around the state, one of the things I did when I was, um, I would go to senior centers, and you can't go in and be, you know, um, as an, ask for election, but I uh, play the piano and sing. So I would go in and do sing-alongs. And in between, and which they let me do, and then in between each one, I would talk about Commonwealth Court, how important <laughs> Commonwealth Court is. Because how would, they didn't understand, but it is the intermediate appellate court in Pennsylvania that impacts individuals um, with regard to the rates they pay for utilities, um, zoning, education, taxation, um, the environment, they didn't understand that. So it was an opportunity to educate them. And the Pennsylvania Supreme Court has been um, very, um, you know, has developed, well, the Commission on Judicial Independence, whose large measure is to educate the public, works with the Rendell Foundation and others, as well as then um, educating the public um, judges. Now we have mandatory judicial education to educate the judges about the code of judicial conduct, which requires fair and impartial judiciary. Um, and in a way, there's a um, respect for the public in an elective system. So you can think about it in the sense that when you're looking at these polls, and it's very disturbing when the public doesn't understand and appreciate how judges make decisions, the decision-making process, the kinds of um, agonizing that judges do um, on all the courts when you're faced with legal principles that you must apply and in an individual factual scenario may not um, appear to be um, you know, consistent with your personal beliefs, but which you are by your oath required to convey. And um, so one way is to bring the public into it. And if you have an elective system, you are forced in some ways. There's a requirement that you need to keep educating the public because you need them to participate, to be knowledgeable um, when they make their selections, to understand what judges do and who the candidates are. Um, and so it does give that opportunity. Um, 
Finally, I would just um, say that um, as a state court judge, and I also share, I'm, I'm a student of Dean Levy's, I went to the um, um, Duke um, Masters um, in Judicial um, Studies, I guess. Um, yes, M Masters of Judicial Studies a few years ago and was introduced to all of these metrics and how judges, you know, how the um, various um, studies there are and the way they look at them to try to understand statistically how judges make decisions and whatever. And um, I agree with everything he said, but um, I was also intrigued by an article that was entitled, um, Professionals or Politicians, the Uncertain Empirical Case for an Elected Rather than Appointed Judiciary by um, Choi Galati and Eric Posner in 2007, describing the results of an empirical study that they did, which found that elected judges write many more opinions than appointed judges, and from some of the metrics they looked at, did not appear to be less independent than appointed judges. So we have our work cut out for us, but. Um, Thank you. We didn't really get into judicial accountability, and, and um, but I, since we have a number of questions which deal with uh, the terms and tenure of judges, I think we'll, we'll go into that. By the way, when I was uh, preparing some questions, I decided to Google the word tenure because I didn't want to keep using it over and over again. And when I Googled it, one of the words for tenure was dynasty. So I thought, well, that was interesting. So I want to start then with Judge McKee in terms of dynasty because basically federal judges serve for life. There have been a number of suggestions about changing that, um, and some people have asked about that, whether that would be a threat to judicial independence if we were to have term limits. And then following what you're going to say, I would like to hear from Judge Renee uh, Cone Jubilier about changing the way uh, the retention elections, whether we should change the way the retention elections are in the state, particularly with an idea towards uh, fair and impartial courts. And one of you wrote, how can, for Judge uh, Cone Jubilier, how can you roll, rule on a hot button case in a way that's an unpopular, in a way that's unpopular, knowing that you're going to stand for retention next year. So let's start with you, Judge McKee, and then we're going to go to Judge Cohn. I, I get nervous when I hear people talk about judicial accountability because I don't know what that means. I don't know what it looks like. That's why uh, we were hoping we were going to hear a definition from all of you. Well, I don't like that. I don't, I don't like the concept, frankly. I, and, and this may not go over real well. I don't think judges should be accountable to anything other than the law and our judicial colleagues. Uh, um, we clearly are not there to take the votes of the public. We clearly should not be accountable to the voting majority. I'll give you one, hopefully, quick example of this. One of the first arguments, well, it wasn't one of the first arguments. Two weeks after September 11, we had a case um, come before a panel that I was on with, with two of my colleagues. And the issue was whether or not a recent change in immigration law was constitutional. The change prohibited someone, precluded someone, who was an illegal um, uh, alien from getting an automatic hearing uh, to sh be able to show that they weren't a risk of flight or danger to the community pending their removal. So in other words, once the order of removal was entered, between the order, time of the order of removal was entered and the actual removal, the prior to this law, the person was able to show they weren't a danger, weren't a risk of flight, they could be at liberty prior to the time they were removed. They were removed, the amendment did away with that. Um, presumption of a, um, a hearing. It meant that people were being detained, and there was a challenge to the constitutionality of that. And I remember when I read the briefs, I, was, I thought that the law was unconstitutional, but I was very concerned that this argument was occurring two weeks after September 11 because of the climate. Um, we went into, and I, 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 I'm always prepared for, like to think I'm always prepared for argument and for conference, but I went into the conference with outlines of my outlines of my outlines, thinking that I was gonna have to conduct like a 30 minute filibuster to get a second vote on my position. To my uh, surprise, I went first, I was the most senior person. The other three judges totally agreed and two or three minutes afterwards, I was interrupted and just said, so Ted, you want to first? And I said, yeah. And there was no, um, really no discussion. We all three of us agreed. We circulate our opinions before they're filed and then after they're filed to make sure that the, our presidential opinions, to see whether or not a majority of the court or any colleagues on the court have any suggestions or comments or want to vote for rehearing. There was not one vote for rehearing. And I was 
proud, and to this moment, I think I've never been prouder of being a federal judge than I was then, with all the emotion that was out there, with all the tension and trauma and fear, we were able to look at the law and determine whether or not um, the underlying decision was correct. Now, the, the Ninth Circuit had the same issue. They went the, other, they went the same way, actually. Steve ran her with the opinion. The Supreme Court reversed the Ninth Circuit. Thank you, not us. So that, that, ended up not being, that ended up not being the controlling law. But at this day, I'm incredibly proud of that. Now, if we put accountability into that, I'm guessing that would have been a very, very unpopular decision because of the emotion. And I can go back in history through the laws of miscegenation and everything else, the, the um, um, uh, laws growing out of Jehovah's Witnesses and military service and whether or not they should stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Very unpopular decisions that the courts, because we're not accountable to the body public, have been able to just focus on the legal issue. So, Again, I think we, we have to be accountable to the law. How you measure that is a problem. We have to be accountable to our colleagues. I do not think we should be accountable to the electorate. And to the extent we start going down that road, we're in a very, very dangerous road. And by definition, I think that is the antithesis of judicial independence. So you're saying that life, lifetime appointment helps judicial independence. Absolutely. Let Absolutely. me tell you what um, uh, somebody, somebody wrote here is, what do you think about limiting the Supreme Court terms to a fixed number of years so that no president has an undue influence on the future of the court, and that, as the Constitution, those justices could move to lower courts after their Supreme Court term ends. Well, they, can, they can kind of do that now, informally anyhow. I think if you start tinkering with those kinds of things, it increases the, it, it, it further increases the politicalization of the court, because people start then running on who they're, and to the extent, unfortunately, where they're now, but people start running on uh, how many Supreme Court picks they will get, and it's a certainty that they're going to get the picks. Uh, the shirt list keep bubbling up now, which is incredibly unfortunate. Anything that puts politics in the middle of a judicial consideration or starts putting to the public who should be elected president or anybody else based upon who that person would put on the court and focuses it, it's going to be there as a subject. Mm -hmm. To the extent that that is focused, I think we're, we're in dangerous territory. I, would, I don't think it's a good idea. Okay, as to the state courts then, as, as you know, we have now a retention election, to Judge uh, Cone Jubilier and Bob want to comment on, 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 on that. Well, and I, um, I want to be very clear that I, I don't believe, I don't believe any state court judges think that they're accountable to public um, whim or what that their decisions should be based on what the public you know thinks um, is is appropriate at the time and we have a code of judicial conduct that very clearly articulates that um, the, the decisions are based on the law so there's an accountability I suppose to to the law um, one of the things and you talk about when we try to think of it as merit retention in Pennsylvania um, is how quickly um, is, is, the, is the judge doing the job efficiently? Is the ju judge doing the job consistent with their um, judicial obligations? And um, so, and, and it gives the public an opportunity um, to, um, to look at that and determine, and it, maybe it's m even more um, specific with uh, local judges, but um, statewide um, to do that. The um, interesting whether or not or to what extent the um, upcoming retention election affects judicial decision making. I know Dean Levy mentioned some studies and um, there, has, there was a, a recent study and it, again, you know, it's difficult to sort of figure this out. I know on my own experience is that, and first of all, when um, you're on an appellate court, you make ju decisions as a group. And so the um, uh, ability of your colleagues, of course, as well, to be involved in the decision making would, to the extent there would be an influence, would re uh, you know, reduce the um, ability, that, that decision making. Um, they, are, they have seen in studies that there are more, um, minority opinions perhaps written in that retention year so that judges who may be up for retention can explain their position in greater detail. Um, and um, so I, there are, as Dean Levy said, as um, Judge McKee has expressed, always going to be 
times when judges must ex exercise their courage and show their integrity and make decisions that are difficult. And that's what the public predominantly expects. That's what the judges expect of each other. And I think it's what um, the, the, pub the public demands and requires. And so, um, yes, you have to make the tough decisions knowing that you may lose your job when you're a state court judge. Yeah, but well. that's, it goes to character. And yeah. Bob, let's bring in, in Bob Hyman. You yeah. can, because of time, you can either respond to the retention issue or you can throw out any suggestions that you think for improving either, um, um, sele improving um, the selection system or the public perception of the courts. Well, my, my experience is limited to Pennsylvania, but I think um, and this may be an anti-democratic view with a small d, I think retention elections are pretty much worthless. Um, you know, if you look at the history of uh, retention elections in Pennsylvania, I can only remember one in which uh, a Supreme Court justice was not retained over the last 40, 50 years. And it's pretty much always uh, a yes vote on retention. I, I don't think retention elections do much. Um, I, I think that, um, uh, uh, I, I agree with Judge Hubel here that people always uh, respond in polls to say um, yes, and, and the argument's always made by pro-election people that you know you're going to take away people's right to vote. Uh, people always say yes, don't take away my right to vote. But if you ask them whether they'd like to be able to vote on which system they'd like, they always answer yes to that too. So you get a lot of yes answers as to both, and and. Uh, and just to go back to one quick story, I remember some years ago, a friend of mine came back from court and was kind of sad. And I said, what's wrong? And he said, um, I was sitting there and the judges came out and, um, uh, and I was waiting to argue. But when I saw the judges, my client, I turned to my client and I said, wow, one of these judges got a lot of campaign money from the opposing lawyer. And he looked at me and said, well, why didn't you give money? <laughs> well, that says it all. Uh, Ju <laughs> Judge Makita, as a wrap-up because of the time, do you want to throw in any suggestions? I, I just, I'll give one quick retention story, which um, probably is what Bob said. I was on the court for 11 years, court of common peace, so I did run for retention. And during that retention, I was nervous, and I was getting, getting ready to go to all these board meetings and go to buy tickets for the Democrats and the Republicans for the dinner, and a colleague of mine was doing the same thing. She was going crazy. Uh, the, the judge, who was my administrative judge, I was speaking with him, and he said, what are you doing all this for? And I said, well, you know, I've got this retention election coming up. So he said, Ted, no matter what you do, a third of the people are going to vote no, two-thirds of the people are going to vote yes, you're going to get retained. So I didn't know anything. I gave no money, bought no tickets, went to no ward meetings. My friend, on the other hand, must have put out 15 grand going to ward meetings and buying tickets. She got two-thirds yes, I got two-thirds yes. <laughs> I think they're probably as useless as Bob thinks they are. Okay, a second wrap-up. Uh, do, do you want to uh, throw out any uh, suggestions that you've been thinking of for, for improving the systems? Well, um, I think that from the stories we've heard, um, the and currently, the, the system isn't going to be changing, I don't think, in Pennsylvania anytime soon. People, um, for whatever reason, find it important to vote for their judges. And in a way, I think that um, knowing that, the Rendell Center, the Commission on Judicial Independence, that the combination of um, educating the public educating judges to make sure that they continue to understand their responsibility and um, know that ethics obligations, having a discipline system, which we do in Pennsylvania, um, where the members of the public, if there is a concern, first of all, can ask for recusal and also file complaints that are investigated and um, so they can be assured of the, um, the the, the judge's um, behavior, um, as well as, um, well, okay. yeah, well, my sessions like this. My suggestion yeah. to Judge Randell is that we go on for another half hour, because we have <laughs> great 
questions here. We have good here, questions. Well, but, uh, <laughs> we have a break for 15 minutes, so the people who didn't get their questions answered, why don't you just come up and oh, detain man. these people okay. and ask your questions? I'd like yeah, we to have thank a, you. Thank you, panelists. Yeah, 15 minute break. Thank you so much. And we'll be back here at quarter of to hear from Professor Charlie Jay. <laughs>